Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner-operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. For this episode, I talked to Shane Backer of SBB Corals. You can check out his website for some serious, crazy coral action at sbbcorals.com. I was really hoping to get some crazy tips out of Shane, and I think we covered a lot of ground, but at the end of the day, I hate to say it, kind of hate to say it, love to say it. His success is really all about keeping it simple. And the good news about that is pretty much anybody can emulate his exact configurations. And he's extremely transparent about his methods, as you will find in this conversation. Thanks to the direct support of hobbyist Bobby Heath, I'm happy to bring this podcast to you absolutely ad free. If you want to support us, the best things you can do are like, share, write us a review, and definitely subscribe. Not enough people are hitting subscribe. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for future guests, please reach out. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Shane Backer of SBB Corals. All right. Well, Shane, thanks for joining me, man. We made this happen. Thank <laughs> yeah, man, it was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much for inviting me on. Yeah, man. Um, I've been looking at your pics on Instagram and I mostly was impressed with your organization of frags. Like I, <laughs> like the way you have everything laid out is, uh, is it's pretty cool, man. Thanks. Yeah, no, we, um, you know, when we do our sales, we basically, I needed to come up with a method because, you know, if you're putting up like 600 SPS corals, yeah, it's yeah. almost like a needle in a haystack to find them. So yeah, we, uh, yeah, we developed like a little method there. Crazy. Sounds like you're uh, moving a lot of moving a lot of pieces then. Yeah, um, you know, we're we're trying. Um, we're definitely, you know, we've expanded as a as a business. I mean, we started as a hobby, and you know, we just continue to grow and and meet people and find new customers. So yeah, the yeah. demand. Luckily, hopefully, the demand stays and and continues to grow. Yeah, is your setup based out of your house? I think. It is. Um, yeah. Well, I, I move now, but what the setup is, it's we have a, uh, a three family house and we basically also finished uh, the basement completely. Mm -hmm. So the, the farm is basically in uh, like the basement of this three family house, which like it, it's almost like its own like level. It's yeah. about uh, twelve hundred square feet. So oh, it's, nice. it's pretty, that's a good amount of space. Yeah, it's pretty decent. Sweet. Yeah. So do you have uh, some employees? You must you must need help at this point. I mean, because you aren't you like a full time mortgage broker as well? I think you were. Yeah. Me. No, I'm a. Yep. Yep. Full time in mortgages, and um. Yeah. I mean, we're we we have like two full time employees, and it's crazy because there's still some like slack on the back end that that we still like. <laughs> are falling behind. So now I'm, I'm yeah. about to put an ad out for, uh, for like a third, like just like a two day or like a three day a week, like part time nice. you know, type of deal. Yeah. It's probably hard to find people you can really trust too. I mean, I mean, I guess packing corals is one thing, but you're probably in charge of, you know, most of the chemistry and the running the actual systems. Uh, like, do you have anybody that, that that's kind of your right hand person or? Yeah, no, I've been very, very lucky. Um, someone named Ralph Aurelio, which has just been like a blessing for me. He actually is my neighbor. Mm -hmm. He lives like directly oh, across nice. the street. And it was just like a really lucky situation because when I first moved into this house, which was about eight years ago now, um, you know, he was just kind of the guy that would help around like the neighborhood, like just really friendly guy. And it turns out that in he in his basement, he had like wall to wall freshwater tanks. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, like just like the natural thing. And I was joking around with him. I was like, yeah, like, you know, one day we're going to convert your whole basement to salt water, um, which we did. <laughs> so yeah. we have like, <laughs> like, you know, like our farm is like overflowing like into his, you know, basement. Nice. Um, but he's basically like the first guy that I took on full time. And, you know, he's, he's amazing. I mean, he's, he tests all parameters. Um, he knows how to run all the systems and, you know, I basically tell him like what to dose, you know, he'll basically test everything and then he'll send me like, you know, all the parameters on like a sheet of paper and then 
I'll just tell them like, all right, adjust this and that. So yeah, yeah he pretty much runs all that. That's yeah. Cool. How many um, total systems in your your setup would you have? Like as far as com- completely separated different water chemistry kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So we have, I'm just going to count them. I think it's four, but let me just yeah. count one, two, three. Yeah. So we have four separate, completely separate systems and each system basically has like multiple tanks plumbed together. Each system also has like multiple sumps plumbed together. Mm-hmm. But in terms of testing parameters and water changes, it's, it's four separate systems. Yeah. Yeah. Four is not too bad. I wouldn't want to go, I think, more than that because it's just it's all that testing you have to do. Right. Like, are you using any auto testing, any like try to enter anything like that? Um, this is my little buddy right here, by the way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have, we have Tridents on all four systems. Uh, you know, I casually look at the Tritons. I mean, for me, I'm just looking for the outliers. Like yeah. if all of a sudden that elk shoots up from eight to nine, or if the pH shoots down or if the salt, I don't even really look at the salt on there. And, and for me, it, it's just something I could look at just to see if anything jumps, jumps like one way or the other, yeah. but I definitely rely on weekly testing of everything uh, as well. Yeah, no, I agree. You definitely have to do manual testing with those because, yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to get on autopilot and, and, and just think the Trident is, is correct. And most of the time, I think it's pretty good. I do find like the calcium starts to get a little off as the reagent gets lower. But uh, overall, it's definitely saved me some like lots of little swings that it would have been much worse if I, you know, hadn't tested that day manually. So, yeah, it's all all about that stability for sure. Um, so, do you do anything differently between the systems, like as far as like experimenting, or is are they run fairly similar? It's a great, you know, it, they all run pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the tanks that we have is a well, they, I can't really say that. So two of the tanks we tr- well, we run them all similar in terms of like you know how we f- you know like the filtration and all of that. One of the tanks, which is a Ghani tank, that tank uh, we actually don't have the Triton running at this moment. We just kind of let it go for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And that tank we we keep the NO3 and the PO4 like really really high, and that's in the Ghani tank. Like the PO4 mm-hmm. is like. Point point three five point four. Yeah, the NO three is like thirty. Yeah, and wow. on that tank. Yeah, we don't dose any alkalinity. We don't do, we don't dose any calcium or magnesium in that tank at all. So we kind of just you know keep that tank that way. Um, but is it just water it. changes that kind of keep keep up the major elements on that system? It's interesting because I mean I guess Ghanis don't consume like at a super high rate compared to say SPS. So you're probably not noticing. Um, like a huge, a huge consumption. Yeah. I mean, we use the salt that we use is the Red Sea Pro. Yeah. So oh, I so high that, elk. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's high elk, which, you know, it's interesting because every time, like I love to keep my elk between seven and eight, like one of my tanks right now, one of the SPS tanks, the elks is like six and a half percent. Uh, which is fine. Hmm. I like to keep it between seven and eight. Yeah. But every time we do it, we like a 15% water change. Every time we do a water change, if the alk is seven and a half, it jumps up to like 8.25. Yeah. So like every single week we're having like this alk swing and I'm like, hmm, would it be better if I went onto the Red Sea regular? Mm-hmm. And then in terms of like salt and testing, I mean, one thing you said, you know, what do you do? Do you test things in different tanks? Not really. Uh, you know, like one thing I, I kind of like use Ralph's system as like tests. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say that. Was on the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, one of the things, you know, we used to use the Tropic Marine Pro salt, mm-hmm. you know, obviously you probably heard of that whole thing with Turkey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It took yeah. down like majorly took down our systems. Oh, you had issues and, too. Hey, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, listen, I, I, I don't know, like they claim, oh, there's no issues or whatever, but like anyone who was using that salt could say there was an issue. And our fingers literally used to like, I, like, you know, when you frag and like the back of your finger, like right there, like it just gets kind of like, yeah, a little like it, rough or it numb. peels like yeah. it gets, no, not rough. Like yeah. it was blistering. Yeah. <laughs> like our, our fingers would blister. And I don't know if, if it was from the salt or not, but once we switched, like it stopped blistering. So I have to assume yeah. it was it could have been from that but so i was considering going back to tropic marin pro 
And about three months ago, we switched Ralph to Tropic Marin Pro to see if mm-hmm. the salt would do anything different. Mm-hmm. And so far, we don't have any conclusion. Like it, it's not like much better or anything. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we might have him switch to the Red Sea regular salt to see it, how that does, because we're considering going to the regular Red Sea just because, you know, with that, there wouldn't be any elk swings. So yeah, that's interesting, though, because, I mean, I guess it says something about alkalinity if you can have a jump like that, because um, I've had that concern with that black bucket, too. Um, if you can have a jump like that and it doesn't really affect anything, um, maybe that kind of swing isn't really... I don't know. Maybe it's not as detrimental as you would think, you know, like obviously things seem fine. Right. And you're always having these little jumps. Yeah, no. And we, you know, listen, like if we literally get a brand new shipment of coral that comes in, you know, we're like, like then like two days after we get the shipment in, we're doing a 15% water change with this higher alk. And it's like, it's Mm. absolutely fine. Like we don't see anything dying from it at all. Like, I don't know if my growth or something would be better if there wasn't that swing, but certainly I don't think things are dying Mm. because I mean, your stuff looks really good. So, I mean, you're doing a lot of things, right? (laughs) But um, (laughs) yeah, I mean, something I would suggest, and I was doing this with the red sea is I was actually mixing the blue bucket and the black bucket together because I think the formula is pretty much the same. And uh, I was finding the elk was a little low on the blue. It was coming in at around, I think I measured it around seven to seven and a half. Yeah, maybe hit seven and a half in some batches, but it was lower than it advertises that it is. Um, So I did like a five to one ratio of the blue to the black, and that put the elk around eight. So something to consider. Uh, Are you using the the Red Sea for salt too? So I actually, interesting, uh, I just switched to Tropic Marin um, about a month ago, and I've done... I've been doing smaller weekly weekly water changes instead of uh, like monthly water changes. And uh, I mean, it seems like a great product. It mixes up fast. Um, you know, have, I haven't really noticed any difference in coral color or growth. Um, it's just nice having that peace of mind when you mix the salt that it's, you know, it's nice and clear. Probably 15, 20 minutes that salt is is clear in my mix tub. So, um, yeah, I think it's and is that the Is that the pro or is that the yeah, regular the, that the you're pro, using? The pro reef, yeah, yeah. Reef. Okay. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, not to like start asking you all these questions. No, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm like always trying to learn stuff. And yeah. so here's the thing. So just today, we basically, every two months, we basically pull apart our mixing station. We, you know, use citric acid to, you know, clean it. We power wash it. When I, sh- if I were to show you how much crud mm-hmm. was in like the piping, it, it was like black. Crazy. Literally, like you, I could take my finger and I could put my initials in it. And, you know, one of my friends said, oh, well, you know, we use, you know, we use the, the Tropic Marin Pro and it's clear, no problem, no residue. So mm-hmm. my question to you is like, did, have you noticed that there's a residue there or? Um, is it so been- I used to use Brightwell and I found there was tons of that dark, rusty colored residue on the mixing reservoir and when I switched to Red Sea, that kind of all just went away. So Red Sea, didn't, I didn't seem to have that issue uh, and definitely not with the Tropic. But I think part of it is, um, you know, some salt manufacturers say that you're supposed to use the water change water like once it's mixed, you're supposed to use it within that day. And I think it has to do with some of those elements can sort of calcify on surfaces. But it doesn't make sense to me because it's just salt water that's going to be in the tank anyways. Like, what's the difference? Is it because it doesn't have anything to react with? Like, it's just water in a tub? I'm not sure. But it'd be something to look into for sure. But you notice caking yes. with the uh, with the Red Sea. Oh, my God. I'll send you some uh, yeah. pictures so that way you can add it to this uh, clip. And you're going to see that it's literally like black on not black brown like you know it literally yeah. looks like it, it, it just came out of like a dust storm you yeah know, like a like it just so what one of my mentors uh told me was that what he does is in his in his mixing station he puts like a 200 micron filter sock mm-hmm. and what he does is he puts the he hangs the filter sock in the, the the mixing container mm-hmm. and the top of the filter sock is out of the water and then he puts the salt into the filter sock mm. and then the, the salt dissolves so that way all of that residue stays in the filter sock mm-hmm. 
And he yeah. said that from that method, his water's crystal clean every time, and he doesn't get that residue. So, like, I literally just ordered those filter socks today. Yeah. No, that sounds like a good thing to try, actually. Um, yeah. And on, on another note, is something I was going to ask you about. Um, I think I when you were on Reef Bum, you were talking about um, how important you think uh, RO filter maintenance is and, uh, you know, the, the membranes and stuff. Uh, can you kind of reiterate that a little bit? Because I think some people tend to neglect that side of things. And obviously, you know, depending on, um, you know, your municipality and their water treatment, that's going to change. But uh, I don't know. I'm curious what what if you can kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think you probably saw that on the American Reef channel. Mm, could have been that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been uh, fortunate uh, fortunate enough yet to to been to be invited as a guest on Reef Bone. Okay. Um, I would love to you know be be a guest on there. But yeah, we haven't uh, been a guest on there yet. Um, but yeah, basically what I'm what I was saying in that uh, American Reef uh, YouTube channel uh, uh, talk was that in terms of the the RDI, in terms of the the machine, right? Like how many times I clean the filters and everything? Mm -hmm. That was your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, this, people might think I'm crazy and what what it is, is the membrane. So we're, we're probably making every single month, just trying to think how much we're making, two, four, six, eight. We're probably making about 800 to 1,000 gallons a month of salt. Mm -hmm. And so we change our membrane every single two months. Wow. And what we found is that if we change it less frequent, like if we change it after two months, like three months, four months, we notice that the, the SPS, it, it loses polyps and it the SPS just like kind of looks a little dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so every time, and so like, before I had like people helping me, you know, I would say, oh my God, my SPS looks dry. It's losing polyps. And I'd say, oh, I didn't change my, change my membrane. It's been four months. Mm -hmm. And then I would change the membrane. You know, we would burn off like 50 gallons of water after that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we would get the PE back. We'd get the, you mm. know, the skin would get thicker and it would kind of get like that wettish look, right? Like just looking healthy and polyps. And I don't know what it is because like, even if we don't change the membrane for six months, like the TDS is still zero. Yeah. So, See, that's the interesting I, thing. If the TDS is reading zero, like what's getting through? Here's the thing. Yeah. Something's getting through. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so people message me all the time. They say, oh, what can we do to get, you know, polyp extension? And what can we do to get our color and crusting and whatever? I say, well, when's the last time you changed your membrane? Mm -hmm. They said, oh, what's a membrane? <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, those filters that are on top of your, you know, yeah. RODI unit, they say, oh, we, you know, we haven't changed that for a year. You mm -hmm. know, people recommend don't change it for a year. TDS is zero. I said, nah, I said, go ahead, change that membrane, change every single filter, then burn off 50 gallons of water. Let me know in a month how you're doing. Mm -hmm. they, they respond back in a month. PE is there. Everything looks great. So like people have confirmed this theory. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's getting through. And and just to further that, another thing that I know people do is they they don't keep like like a, a reservoir for their 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 non salt water, right? The regular mm -hmm. um what is it? Like the RODI water yeah, when they yeah. do top the, the top off, right? So some people they don't keep the they don't make the water, put it in a bin and then put the the um the 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 ATO in the bin right they mm -hmm. don't get the water from the bin what they do is on their RO uh, on their um the unit that makes the RDI water it automatically tops their tank off like they have a solenoid right so mm -hmm. it turns on and off yeah and whenever the tank evaporates the RODI unit makes the water and then it puts it into their tank mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now here's the thing. Whenever I turn my RODI unit off and then turn it back on, the TDS is never zero. Like I have to mm. burn off like 30 gallons worth of water until it's zero. Really? So if you are topping off your water directly from your RODI unit, I don't know how you're doing – it's getting at zero because yeah. every time it turns on and off, I, I, I don't – I mean you could test it out, right? They could, mm -hmm. they could see – if it's zero when they turn it right back on, and I don't think it is. Yeah. So someone like three days ago messaged me. They said, oh, you know, we're not getting polyp extension. What's your secret? And I started talking to them, and they said, oh, 
you know, I said, oh, when you had your change your membrane or whatever, I said, how do you, you know, get your RDI water? And they said, oh, it, it comes directly from the, from the, you know, from the unit. I said, wait a second. I said, you better make sure that it's zero the second it turns on. And then he, he went back and checked. He goes, oh, you're right. Mm-hmm. He goes, man, he goes, ever since I've been in this hobby, I've, I've, I've been doing that. And I'm like, you got to change that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, another thing I would say would be a benefit to having your RO in a tub is I, I believe chlorine and some of those other, um, you know, cl- those type of elements, they dissipate uh, if the water sits. So, you know, if you're not pulling all the chlorine out, there's a chance that that's going direct into the tank too. So another, another and thing. To, one thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, one thing I wanted to ask you, your, your opinion on. So the other thing I was a little like paranoid about is, okay, well, you know, we're collecting all this water in these these you know uh fresh water containers and like that water never evaporates to zero like it's always 30 percent full at you know at a minimum Mm -hmm. i'm wondering like does bad bacteria like start you know cultivating in there yeah so is there still an issue like with that i don't know i think it would probably help to just have a small amount of flow at all times um you know some people i think in their RO, ro water will put like a silicate filter in um, cause I think silicates are one of the sort of things that seems to like, I've, I've, our, our, uh, ICP'd my RO a few times and there's been some silicates, not like at crazy high levels, but, um, you know, I'd rather they be next to zero. Um, cause that's, uh, that's going to grow algae, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thought because I actually, um, I have a lot of safety mechanisms in place, but my RO does feed my three systems all like they're all kind of, um, in a kind of a system all together with float switches and some other, you know, safety mechanisms, but it does come straight out of my RO unit. So, um, it's something I never thought about, but, uh, I might, so you don't have a fresh water reservoir. No, then? no, I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a reservoir that I make my salt water in that I fill with RO and sometimes I use that RO for other stuff. But, um, as far as my actual top off, it's coming straight out of the unit. So. so maybe I'm crazy then, because I mean, your corals look great. Like even right before this call, I was checking out your Instagram and, and you know, seeing all the stuff that you're doing there. Yeah. And I was like, man, his corals look amazing. Yeah. So, but So maybe I'm wrong. I mean, but you check it yourself. I mean, you'll see when, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's uh, depends on where you live, too, because I live in one of the parts of the world. We have some of the best water in the world here. So, <laughs> you know, that's probably part of it. But um, uh, something else to consider, I just add is um, people should check their municipalities. Um, public water for chloramine because a a lot of our um, carbon filters take out chlorine but they don't take out chloramine Um, and there's I think it's Pentec is that the name it makes they make a a chloramine and chlorine filter and it's like I think it's built better like it lasts like like four or five times longer than a normal carbon block Um, so I mean it's something you can anybody can look into their municipal water and and see what the treatment is like they have to disclose it Um, so yeah like I've I've seen some people have some serious issues with with chloramine um, and municipalities will change the composition sometimes too so it's not always going to be the same year to year what is your uh, what's your TDS coming out of the tap? I mean, you claim it's super clean. So um, I feel like the last time I checked it, it was like twenty or something. Like it was nothing crazy. I can't even remember what oh. what is considered high. What's high, or what would be? I like... mean, <laughs> <laughs> so twenty. Mine's at uh, you know, like two hundred and fifty coming out. Oh, okay, of the tap. yeah, no. Like I said, we have good water here, <laughs> but that's funny um but that's interesting you mentioned that about the ro membrane thing because um you know one of the things i often ask my guests is if there was you know a change they made to their system where there was like a very positive like you can attribute you know the positive result to a specific thing you didn't do four things at a time you know what i mean you did this one change and you saw that result would you say there's anything else you've you've seen like a really positive shift from that you've done no Really, I mean, that's pretty much like the one aha moment. But besides that, I haven't really seen like anything uh, super drastic. You know, I mean, one thing is like check for stray voltage. I know one time yeah. like, you know, we found some stray voltage and, you know, we stopped that. I don't know if that was causing any issues, but like it was, you know, sometimes we would put our hands in the tank and, you know, we'd have like little cuts and it was just like stinging yeah, us you every can time. Feel it. And if you've got a little cut, that's your indication for sure. Yeah. yeah, it was what it was. It was a heater, I guess, that uh, one of the cords on the heater was a little frayed. Mm-hmm. And the heater would turn on and off. 
So sometimes we would get shocked and yeah. sometimes we wouldn't. But <laughs> w- once we figured it out, though, like it, it, it stopped it right away. That's funny. So. You probably f- thought like you're losing your minds a little bit. You're just like, ah, do you feel it? I don't feel it right now. <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, like any products that you're super fond of using, you would kind of highlight at all? So we, we product wise, I mean, you know, we... Not, oh, well, yeah, there's one product that I really like. Uh, it's American Reef HPD, which is a specific type of food that you make. You basically boil it in water, and then once you boil it, you put it into, like, the food product, and then it, it is, like, this gummy consistency. And mm-hmm. then what you do is you take the food, and then you hang it from a bag. Like, you tie the bag, like, around your lights or whatever, so it's dangling in the water, mm-hmm. and then – what it is is the fish pick directly at the bag. So absolutely no food is wasted into the system at all. The food goes right into their bellies. Mm-hmm. And I think that has been like an amazing uh, thing for us because there's like zero food waste. You have no, nothing decaying in rocks. Yeah, nothing down the water, the overflow or filter socks or anything like that. Yeah. No, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I'll get a, I'll get the name from you again at the end, but uh yeah, that's interesting. Um, are you doing anything like aminos or like any anything? It sounds like you're pretty simple setup. Yeah, so I, I'll go. I'll kind of. We don't use any aminos. We don't feed the corals at all. The only thing we feed the corals is this American Reef HPD, but mm-hmm. we don't feed them direct. You know, we hang it from this bag, and and the fish basically eat it. So I guess the, the corals are indirectly eating the fish poop, mm-hmm. and. We don't, we don't feed anything else. I mean, we don't direct feed the corals. We don't use any aminos. Uh, we, we really don't even dose anything like reef moonshiners. Like we don't, you know, we don't dose any specific elements. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think like just the Red Sea Pro water changes basically take care of all of that. Yeah. And you know, the only thing we do though, I guess you can, cause the way that we feed, it's such a clean method to feed that our NO3 and PO4 basically goes to zero. Yeah, I was going to ask and about so, that. Yeah. Yeah, so it basically, like, we don't have any Cato. We don't have any refugium. We don't have any of that stuff. We're not growing any macro, macro algae. And it's just a super clean system. And the NO3 and the PO4, you know, tend to, to start dropping. And so what we do is we dose those. So that we like mm-hmm. doing it like that. We like to try to keep it at zero this way because then we can control where mm-hmm. yeah. where we want it. It's a lot easier so, to add it than it is to take it away. Um, you know, I think any reefer would agree with that. And I'm I'm in a similar position in my systems. Like if I if I don't dose those elements or if I don't feed a little bit, like I'd say I've been feeding a bit heavier to keep it up, but I do I would have to feed so much food to get my NO3 and my PO4 up just from feeding. So uh, it's interesting to hear because there's a lot of people that do it very differently than you that are big on feeding. Um, quite a few guests oh. that have been on here. So, yeah, people ask me all the time, you know, oh, my NO3 is low. My PO4 is low. I said, do not overfeed because if you overfeed that way, you know, you'll get algae and it, it'll just I said, keep it where you're at. I said, just buy NO3 and PO4 and dose that into your tank. And that's what we do. So we dose NO3, we dose PO4. The NO3, we like to keep at 20. The PO4, we like to keep at 0.12. And and we're setting that level by by dosing mm-hmm. those those things. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, what did you, what'd you say for nitrate? What was the level? Like between 15 and 30. Okay, okay. So it's it's still pretty elevated. Um, and then 0.12 kind of thing for, for phosphate. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of... Um, yeah, I would say my nitrates are lower, but uh, like similar to kind of what I'm what I'm shooting for too. So, um, yeah, um, that's interesting. I wanted to go back to um, what you were saying about the Ghani system, um, just running a lot higher nutrient because, um, like, do you feed that system heavier, or do you do you dose more nitrate and phosphate in that system? This is. An interesting one. So that system, we feed the same American Reef HPD, mm-hmm. but the PO4 stays at like 0.3 naturally. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, and I mean, like, this is a 180 gallon tank, you know, it's a regular, like, six foot, 
by I don't know what it is like yeah something six by high three. yeah something like that yeah six by three it's literally all Ghanis mm-hmm. every single thing in there is a Ghani they're just on racks I think Ghanis just consume less PO4 than SPS does so I'm thinking maybe that's why the PO4 stays higher in that tank naturally mm-hmm. yeah and it's a sim- maybe consume less similar fish load in in all your systems too like you would say like fish per gallon kind of thing yeah, no, it's we have the fish like packed with tangs. I mean, every fish yeah. in there serves a purpose to eat algae. But yeah, they're they're packed to the brim with with fish for sure. Yeah, and just like I was saying earlier, like how your presentation looks so good and so clean. Like I think, um, you know, that wouldn't work if you had algae growing on the racks and on the the you know display tags and stuff like that. Like, uh, it's not like you're cleaning those every time you post a bunch of stuff, right? Probably clean them See, sometimes, but <laughs> well, I got to tell you, right. We're constantly cleaning algae. Yeah. I mean, that's why we have, like, I had to get a second person to help us because it's literally an algae battle, oh, right? okay. <laughs> like, yeah, no, don't think, like, it's such a, you know, you think, you know, obviously we post what we want people to see. And it's like, yeah. if you guys think my tank is crystal clean with no algae, like, you got to come to my farm. Like, mm-hmm. it's literally, like, every single week we're scrubbing racks, we're changing racks. I mean, it's like one of the tanks was so bad with algae that we literally had we, nothing would kill this algae i don't even know what it was it was yeah. like just like the, the worst thing ever and the only thing that would kill it was um what is it hydrogen peroxide uh, that's we nasty literally to use yeah we literally had to literally take every single rock out dip them in hydrogen peroxide we raised our mag to like 1500 and all of a sudden it disappeared so mm-hmm. i don't know if it was the raising of the mag or the hydrogen peroxide we even in tank dose hydrogen peroxide and after like three months it's like completely gone yeah that's good um i actually had i had quite a bit of alva algae that was an issue on my racks recently you know that kind of green seaweedy looking type stuff and i put um 20 emerald crabs in each i have two six by three tables for my sps i put 20 emerald crabs in each side and within about a month it was pretty much all gone so if you have enough of them you know they're they're gonna get they're gonna get get at it i think if you people think you put two or three crabs or a few hermits in it's not gonna do shit in a big system but uh it definitely worked in mine so it's nice to look at clean racks again and the tangs weren't eat, eating that stuff? The tangs eat it, but the problem is if you've got a bunch of frags on a rack that are close together, those tangs can only reach so well in between some of those spaces. Um, and I've got a few fish. Um, the uh, tail spot blennies are kind of good for getting in there. Um, lawnmower blennies. Some of those fish will will pick in between the, the spaces, but the emeralds just went right to it. Like I, <laughs> I sent, uh, I had gotten them from my supplier and I sent him a pick right away. I was just like, look at this home record. It's like, I should have shown him a before and after, but it was just like, finally like (laughs) things are clean so um yeah they're doing they're doing a good job so you know i think sometimes um i'd say more like the advanced reefing level we kind of overlook um using a cleanup crew sometimes because we're kind of like i don't know like you get to a point where sometimes you don't think you need them and then something creeps up on you and like wait a second like i used to use hermits and stuff and they used to work so (laughs) don't overlook them right yeah, yeah yeah no for sure yeah no we're constantly you know getting snails and we don't we don't do any like hermit crabs or any of those kind of things because just in case we have to like you know dose intercept or something yeah, yeah. just kind of stay away from crabs and you know I, sometimes like i feel like crabs can pick at things where you know like snails can't really do that yeah yeah no i mean they definitely go in the colonies and i feel like maybe there's a little less polyp extension um if one of them's in the colony like they're kind of messing around in there like irritating things a little bit but uh honestly right now i just rather have that algae gone than than uh <laughs> have a little less pe but that's fine but um i, I kind of want to talk about corals i think that's kind of the the main reason i wanted to have you on so uh i think on this podcast we've talked about um like this this difficulty of speciosa a little bit and i don't have a ton of experience with them so i i wondered kind of what's your experience with them and kind of like long term um what you've seen in your systems and with your customers and stuff like that so they're very very hard to keep long term i mean like i even joke around with like some of my suppliers and i don't i don't i don't directly import it i when people get it you know i get mm-hmm. it from them you get it from a wholesaler here. yeah yeah i get it i get it from 
when I see it here in the United States, you know, I'll go for it. I'll get it. But, uh, you know, speciosis, I, I, I literally consider them like ticking time bombs. Like I'm not even joking around. Like I can't even sit here and tell you that like, you know, they're going to live long term. I mean, I know some people that have seen success with them. Mm-hmm. I think that they're very susceptible to any type of parameter change. I think like, you know, even for me, like maybe that Alk swing that I, that I was telling you about, mm-hmm. like, you know, that that may be why they're, they're dying long term. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, we do we do have a few that has basically survived. And I think at that point, you know, it's just like surv- literally it's like survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. So I think like, you know, let's say you bring in or you get like, like let's just say like I don't I don't bring in 100 at a time. But I'm mm-hmm. just saying let's say you get, you know, 100. And let's say like, you know, 90 of them die off. Well, the 10 that are live, those are, that's just like survival of the fittest. So mm-hmm. now you have. Those are the ones that, you want you know, anyways, right? That they, they've proven themselves early on. Yeah. Yeah. They, they've proven themselves early on. But, you know, why they randomly die and why they're so hard to keep, like, I, I honestly don't, I don't know. I mm-hmm. wish I knew. I wish I had the answer. You know, I, I don't know. But yeah. Really, really hard to keep. And I think long term. And, and here's the thing like, you do see a lot of people posting colonies, right? Like, oh, mm-hmm. look at this colony of speciosa. But, you know, then you look like three or four months later at the same person and you're like, but you're not selling any frags. So what happened to your colony? Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, we, we we see a lot of them coming in. We see a lot of colonies posted, but we don't see a lot for resale. Yeah. But like I said, there are those 10% out there that are survival of the fittest. And once you find one of those, then I feel like you have something that you can grow and frag and Mm -hmm. start to continuously sell. So like what percentage of corals that you bring in um, or say get from a wholesaler that kind of end up in in your stock, would you say like get kept for grow out? Like, um, you know, cause like, like it seems like you, you sell a lot of frags that look fairly fresh to you. Like as far as, um, you know, you're importing or whatever. So like how much of it is like long-term keeping grow out frag from that and how much of it is cut from newer stuff? Yeah. So basically what our system is, is we, you know, from Indo, we definitely import from Indo. We import a lot of, you know, colonies. So let's say we get like a shipment of like, you know, 150 colonies out of 150 colonies. I would say like straight DOA coming in, you probably have like, you know, if you have a good supplier, you have five percent DOA. Mm-hmm. If you have a bad supplier, you know you, half of it could be DOA. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. Um, a big thing is you know any supplier who's not shipping with oxygen in the bag, it's like complete suicide. Like mm-hmm. it, literally, it's life or death. Right. So you definitely want a supplier that you know ships with oxygen in the bags, and then there's all these other methods or whatever. But 150 come in. Standard is like let's say five percent DOA. Once that five percent DOA comes in. You know, then you're, I would say, like over another, let's say, month or two, maybe like another 15%, maybe die off. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we basically keep it in our tanks. We quarantine them. We we basically, we try to keep them for at least six to eight months before we start reselling them. Nice. Because, Yeah. yeah, and then like we dip them every single week, even like our, our, our grow out tank, we still dip like every single week because the idea is that we want to not to say like we want to kill things off, but we want to basically have like a broad stock where anything that's like survival of the fittest after like six to eight months of this like intensive dipping every single week, if those live and start crusting, then we feel safe enough where we could then start to cut them and then resell them. Yeah. Where, you know, like obviously things are very finicky. Like if it comes in for us and looks great after two months, you know, I don't know if we sell it to a hobbyist and then like they have like a little swing or parameter swing or whatever and it dies, like, I don't know, it's not really fair for them, right? So we try to keep it for at least six to eight months. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, even people say like, you know, stability, stability is super important. But like when we do those water changes, when we do those alk when the out goes up, you know, from seven and a half to eight and a half, like that little swing or whatever other little swing. That's why I feel like if we keep it for six to eight months and it survives all of that and dips, then mm. we feel like it's hardy enough to then start selling it. So by the time it gets to like the six to eight month mark, starting with those original 150 colonies, 
you know, maybe we're left with like 50 or 60 colonies that then go into like our grow out systems. And mm-hmm. then we can consider something that like we could start to really farm. In yeah. A sense. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, retailer I want to buy from too. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to know you've had it and you put it through that, that testing. Um, because yeah, especially with these speciosa, it's just like seeing them in person. They're some of the nicer acros I've ever seen. So, <laughs> um, if you can be successful, then, um, I think the payoff is pretty, pretty big, but, um, yeah. As so far what as, I would tell you is yeah. for, for that, right? Like I know, so the one thing that we do is once they come in where we dose the tank with chemi clean, like hours before okay. they come in. Mm-hmm. And then anything that we get, it's literally going into a tank that has ChemiClean into the tank. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that alone has really, really helped our survival rate where I feel like before we were doing that, you know, we would, we were losing like 50% of them within like two weeks. And it was like, even now, sometimes when like stuff's coming in, like half DOA, right? Like you get it, it's like half of it is dead. Mm -hmm. Like we'll basically take that. And before we put it into our tank, like we'll just dip it in, um, you know, like regular fresh salt water just mm-hmm. to try to like get whatever off. And then we just throw it into the quarantine tank. And even the ChemiClean like stops that from dying. Mm-hmm. And then it, it'll basically like start to to become healthy again. So yeah. that's been like a game changer for us. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I guess in that respect, you're not introducing any um, foreign strains of bacteria that could be bad news for, for other corals. I, I think I've. I think there's a quite a lot of that coming from Indo, um, which I think has caused some issues for for me um, in the last year or so. And I've talked to a few other people that have kind of had the same come to the same conclusion. Um, but you do hit the systems with with some antibiotics, like um, obviously chemically. And have you done anything else um, like Cipro or oxalinic acid, anything like that? Um, we, we've, the only other thing we've, we've done is Cipro, which also works like really, really well. Mm-hmm. Is, you know, I mean, for us, I don't know why, like our go-to is just chemi clean for whatever reason, but yeah. Cipro works. I think it's, it's, it's pretty much like the same thing. And, you know, you could basically dose chemi clean to your tank and it's absolutely fine. Like you dose it exactly yeah. per the instructions. Um, one tip though with that is that people get frustrated because they put it in there for two days and then what happens is afterwards they complain, they say, oh, we can't get rid of the bubbles, you know, it's just our skimmers don't work properly. Mm -hmm. So you need to know, like, if you have, let's say a 360 gallon system, like on day, on 48 hours when you turn your skimmer back on, like you literally need to skim out like 10 gallons worth of bubbles Mm. for the system to start skimming properly. Interesting. just in your mind, just know you got to skim out 10 gallons worth of bubbles. And wh- mm-hmm. how do you do that? You just, you keep the skimmer, uh, the line that has mm-hmm. the, the excess skim, you just keep it open okay. and you literally skim out 10 gallons of bubbles. And then after that, you're fine. Yeah. That's Maybe good advice. Good. Cause I've definitely gotten messages from a few people <laughs> where they were like, they're like, how do I get the bubbles to stop? <laughs> and I just kind of tell them, you know, why don't I turn the skimmer way down? Like, I don't know. Wow. It's 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 tricky, but so you figure if you just skim that sort of like batch of bubbles and you just let the skimmer bleed it all out, um, yeah. it tends to get it all out. Okay, let's. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. don't 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 keep the skimmer cranked up all the way. Like, if the skimmer's at a hundred percent, maybe take it down to twenty five percent, and then skim out 10, bo- 10 gallons, uh, and then after that, your it will just be working fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So. Um, I guess another thing I was wondering with the Malaysian corals, um, just because this is like I'm coming up in like a week and a half, I think I'm getting these corals. Um, I heard that some of the other species are actually pretty hardy, um, like the tenuous apparently are quite hardy um, and some of those deep water kind of ones. What's what's your experience with those as far as um, like longevity? Yeah, those have been super hardy for us. I mean, the tenuous is super hardy. The millies, you know, the, mm-hmm. the smooth skins, which I'm being told are are lokani, those have been like super hardy. I mean, like we get some of those smooth skin ones that come in, and they literally are bone white. Mm-hmm. Like literally, like we'll go to our supplier here in the United States, and like we'll we'll basically. You know, we'll we'll try to cherry pick whatever we can, but sometimes like we're late and we don't get like the prime pick, and it's like a week or two later, and I'm like, all right, do you have anything left? And then like he literally has like bone white uh, of those smooth skin. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll take those. And then yeah. like we take those in, and like 
literally six to eight months later, they start coloring up and it's like, wow, like this is beautiful. Yeah. Like, and even it coming in bone white, you know, really thin skin, like it doesn't die. I mean, so those have been like really, yeah. really. Hard That's good to know. I mean, some of those have been some of the craziest ones I've seen actually from, from Malaysia. Um, and I don't think that the species terminology is probably correct on a lot of those. Um, like if you look at speciosa from Indonesia, it's a completely different looking coral. Um, so I don't know who decided at what point, you know, what species was what. But I mean, if you look at Malaysia on a, on a map, it's not that far from Indonesia. Um, I mean, like it's pretty amazing how varied the corals are considering um, you know, it's not that far away ge ge geographically. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it seems like one of your kind of, obviously like you do a lot of tenuous, um, any kind of advice for people on tenuous as far as like, um, you know, pulling some of the best colors or growth out of it. I mean, I, like I said, I, I wish I knew what the secret was, you know, people are constantly asking me and I think, <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the secrets is like having the cleanest RODI water you can possibly have. And, you know, for me, that's changing out my membrane every two months, that changing all my other filters once a month, carbon once a month, mm -hmm. you know, the chlorine filter once a month, you know, all the resins once a month. And even when you change out all the filters or half of the filters, actually, every time we turn the, the system on and off, when we turn it on, we burn off like 40 gallons of water yeah. into the street, you know. Yeah. So like that, that's been like a, I think a big one for us. And then, you know, besides that, I, I'm not sure what the secret is. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's probably a bunch of people listening to this that are going to go and change their river or, or order new membranes. <laughs> this should be sponsored by pure attack or something. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, I, I guess I didn't ask you, um, what do you use for your major elements uh, on your systems? Are you using calcium reactors, dosing? What's your What's your style? Yeah, so I use I use a two part from ESV. We mm -hmm. we dose the the alk, mag, and the calc, and I think that a lot of our trace elements also comes from that as well. It, it has to because I don't know where else it comes from. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's we, got we trace use a two part. It. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah we, I think uh, you know it's something I've advised um, newer hobbyists um, once they get to the point where corals are growing and they need to dose something. ESV is just so rock solid, you know, and I mean. I'm at a point where I think it would be too expensive for me to keep up with it, but um, I definitely recommend it highly. It, it just kind of seems like the uh, the elemental composition is pretty, pretty like pretty in line with a lot of um, for what a lot of systems need. So, um, do you do ICPs very often? Yeah, I mean, we we used to do a lot. I mean, we used to do it every two weeks, you know, in like all of our systems. I mean, it really started to add up, but. The reason why we were doing it for some reason or another was to, to test for iodine mm -hmm. because we didn't have a way to test for iodine. But we we have successfully found a way to home test for iodine, which mm -hmm. actually works really, really well. So ever since we found like somebody on Reef to Reef came up with like this crazy iodine test, mm -hmm. which I'll send you the link for, and it literally works. Okay. So yeah. now that we can test We'll, yeah, we'll, link yeah, to it. That to you. we'll link to it because, yeah, I think somebody mentioned it and because um, I know Hannah makes an iodine tester, but it's not in like a seawater range. Um, so I'm guessing is it is it something to do with that where you you change the way the test is done or something completely different? So you basically use, you know, I'll just I'll just send you the link, honestly. Yeah, because... yeah I'll put it in the notes of the, yeah, the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'll put it in the show notes. And it, the point I'm trying to make, though, is that now that we test for iodine, we don't really see a need to send in a Triton. So, like, I haven't sent in a Triton for, like, the last four months. Mm -hmm. um, and everything is, you know, like, if something goes wrong, we, we have Tritons on hand to send them in if we need to. Mm -hmm. But ever since we were able to test iodine, like, I just haven't been sending them in. Probably one of the most important. I mean, it's not even a trace. It is, like, a major element. Um, and, I mean, next to potassium, um, do you test potassium? We don't. No. Okay. Yeah, you probably get enough of it from, uh, I would say the ESV probably gives you a decent amount. But so you're not dosing any other products on top of just water changes and, and you know, the food you were saying um, sounds pretty damn simple. Well, so what we dose is we dose iodine. Mm -hmm. We dose um, PO4, NO3, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. It's literally, <laughs> and I mean, listen, I don't, I don't know. Like sometimes I don't think my corals are growing fast enough or sometimes I think maybe I should, you know, take a little closer look at like the reef moonshiners method or maybe, you know, I don't know. I just, I just keep it super simple and it's just, it's kind of been working. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried, we tried the reef moonshiners method and you know, anyone who doesn't know what it is, I highly, highly advise that, that you research it, that you read all the articles on it and you know, try it because when we learned about it, we, we tried it, we read all the art and we learned so much about yeah. like why not to use an all in one trace element solution. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how there's like those things that like some of the companies sell and it's yeah. like, use yeah. this bottle. It's got like everything. Like, yeah. If you're doing that, I guarantee you, you will crash your system over time. Um, when we first got into this hobby, we were doing it, we were using the red C, the A, B, C, D, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we weren't like sending in a Triton test or anything. Like we were just dosing it blind and like after it, everything looked great for a few months. And then after a while, it stuff just didn't look that good. And we're like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. And then we started sending in Triton tests and we're like, holy shit, our iodine's 140. Like how Whoa. did that happen? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's because of the, the all in one. So I think like those all in ones can work. But you need to really know your salt. So I would send in like a Triton for your salt, and then I would send a Triton in for all of the elements, A, B, C, D. And then you have to like literally know your salt. You have to know what's in those, and then you can kind of like match them up in a sense. Like I know one person does it just like the way I just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and it works fine. But yeah, you got to know what's in what's in those all-in-one solutions. Yeah, those all-in-one solutions. I mean, the problem is like every system is so different that it's going to be consuming those traces at a, at a different rate. I think if you have, you know, macroalgae or chato, refugium, whatever, like that's going to com be completely different than a system that doesn't run run that stuff. So yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, the moonshiners make sense because you're really custom customizing um the consumption but it's a lot of work um but and and like you were saying too um it's there's a ton of information that moonshiners handbook is uh there's so much information in there so um yeah it's a lot to learn <laughs> do you do uh, um what do you, what's your system like that like do you dose different elements like do you dose potassium like how do you yeah i do uh so i'm kind of using the fauna marin icp and i do it about once a month and um i do make the adjustments based on the icp and then um every week there's a couple elements that i add um manually um that i just find are always low um so that'd be like iron uh nickel uh chrome i think are the one oh zinc i add a little bit too um and i think it's just because those um elements just get taken up a lot faster um and maybe the bio the window of bio availability is probably not as long as um some of the other elements that you know can actually even accumulate so it's uh i don't know i mean honestly i've been doing this for about a year and i can't tell you for sure if my corals look way better <laughs> you know mm -hmm. Um, do you, do you use, and I'm, I'm going to set you up for something, but do you use any type of aminos or anything like that? Um, no, I didn't, you know, I'll, I'll go into phases and I'll try aminos for a while. And, um, I don't really think they benefit my system that much. I think they would have more benefit to a lower nutrient system. Um, but, uh, yeah, if anything, I think it's just kind of an expensive way to kind of like darken your corals or, or, you know, I've heard they get converted to nitrates as well. So, um, it's just an expensive nitrate at the end of the day. So the one thing that, that we've kind of like, I don't know, I have no science at all about this, but mm -hmm. I think like tenuous don't really like aminos in a sense, because I know that when we use the dose aminos, I feel like it would burn, uh, mm. the corals. So I know like when we first started importing, we were using aminos and I feel like especially with fresh import, like aminos will literally, and again, I have no science at all. I'm not like a scientist, so I, I, I'm not claiming to be, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I think like with fresh import and aminos, it's like a really bad recipe. Like you, you may lose like 50% of your tenuous or something. So mm -hmm. like, I don't, I, I feel like it burns the tenuous more than it could help. Um, but that's just been like what our experience has been. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I, yeah, I had kind of a semi crash about, two and a half years ago and uh, or a year and a half ago um and i had to nurse a bunch of corals back and i considered the aminos and 
talked to a couple people about it and they said, no, I think the aminos are actually going to be kind of harsh on some of those compromised corals. So I decided to not do aminos. And um, yeah, I mean, actually the thing that really turned the corner for those, the corals that just were bleached and were struggling to come back was when I started dosing flatworm stop um, mm. by KZ. And I think, you know, I don't know if it's the, um, you know, the concoction of wormwood or whatever kind of herbal medication is in there, but um, there's quite a bit of potassium and iodine um, and some other trace. And I could have just been deficient in those. And that might have been what made the difference. Um, but uh, that's a product I do dose. Um, I'd you still like... dose that too? Yeah, I, I cut the dose down um, as my iodine was actually getting a little high. Um, and somebody ICP'd it and we saw that the iodine was, was high on it. So... Um, you know, just trying to kind of figure out what, what was causing that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I'm envious of the way you run your setups because like, it sounds a lot simpler than mine. And sometimes I, I look back at my old tanks and I'm like, yeah, I've gotten pretty complicated. <laughs> you know, I mean, the other thing is like, we don't, you know, we don't run any GFO. We don't run any UV sterilizers. We don't run any carbon. You know, we don't do any of that stuff. And, you know, we used to also use the KZ flatworm stop. And then, like, I don't know, like, for some reason we stopped. And then, like, once we stopped, I feel like everything, like, didn't really look that good. And then it, someone told me, like, oh, you know, it's like your corals are, like, on steroids. And you yeah. take it off. And then yeah. it just kind of, like, deflate. And, withdrawals. You know, <laughs> yeah. withdrawals. And I think, like, you know, in my mind, a lot of what I'm doing, I'm wondering, like, how is this going to affect when the coral is in someone else's tank, right? Yeah. Because obviously like we're, we're selling, we're selling, we're selling, you know, we're, we're spreading frags around. And I feel like with the KZ, you know, if we're using it, but maybe someone who buys, buys our frags is not using it, then I just get worried. Like, well, okay, well, how are that frag doing their system if they don't have it and I'm using it? So I feel like a lot of our methods are, are really like, it put in place to 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 basically like in a way where like when someone else buys our coral like it'll do well in their system mm -hmm. in a sense mm -hmm. so yeah that's why like we keep things like really simple and like even like dosing all of those things like you know potassium and and all those things you mentioned i feel like but what if other people aren't doing that right so then i feel like well if we beef up our corals then maybe if we sell them and someone else isn't doing that then maybe it won't look as good in their tank or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like yeah, something we, we I, think, I, think about. I think that's a good point. And, and something I've kind of discussed with a couple of people is like use of metal halides in a, in a, in a farm style setup, because like very few hobbyists have metal halides in their home anymore and on their home aquarium. So, you know, if these corals were colored up and grown under metal halides, like how are they going to adapt to led, you know? So like, I think growing them under the conditions that is going to be, a bit more of an average for the average user it is it is a good way to to do it um yeah and obviously you're very transparent about the way you keep your systems you're not you're not like hiding any secrets or anything <laughs> right <laughs> so no i mean yeah. i wait listen i wish i had secrets i mean i just like i'm an open book and you know everyone says like well how do you do it i'm like i, I don't know like I, I wish i could tell you i mean i do think like a lot, I mean, when you come to our tanks, like you'll definitely see the colors are there. Like when people see the colors at the shows, they're like, wow, like it actually looks like the pictures. Yeah. I mean, I think another thing is, and, and this is all psychology, right? People say, oh, well, my corals aren't looking great. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like your corals are, are looking amazing. Like I feel like you almost have to teach people how to look. And this is everyone, right? Like some people, their, their corals are just not colored up, whatever. Mm -hmm. But some people like have like really nice colored up corals, but they're just, they're not looking at their tank under blue light. Like they're looking at it under white light. And I feel like you almost have to like teach them how to look at the corals a certain way under the light. Mm -hmm. And then once they learn how to look at the color, like, wow, like, yeah, it does, it does have color. So I, I don't know, like maybe some of it is like how the corals presented or, mm -hmm. you know, like what light, like when you go to a show, like what light is the coral under or, or, or stuff like that? Like, it's just something that maybe you, people should consider also. Yeah. Yeah. Like what's your kind of lighting choice as far as like, are, are you mostly running the same kind of lighting on your setup or? 
Yeah, so we we basically use the same exact lights for every single tank. Uh, we mm-hmm. use the Radeon. Um, we started with the G4, so we have like half of our lights are G4. Then mm-hmm. some of them broke, so then we have to get the G5, and then we got new systems, so then we have to get the G6. Always so changing. they're they're basically <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean they're they're all Radeon, and we we get the the pro version of all of them, mm-hmm. and we run the lights at the exact schedule, the AB plus schedule with zero deviations and. We run them in the SPS tank. We're up to like 80% intensity. Mm-hmm. And for like, you know, for like the mushrooms, the torches and the ghanis, we're running them low, like at like 30, 34% mm. intensity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is that kind of like a uh, AB plus kind of schedule? Or do you kind of do your own custom? Like, uh, no, it's the exact AB plus schedule. Yeah. We don't customize anything yeah. at all. Cool. Yeah. See, that's another thing that I think the end user can kind of take from you, right? Like you can sell them the coral. You can say you can get the exact same setting on your Radeons as this was kept under, you know, use the, use the ESV if you want to use the same, you know, major element. So yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate that if I was buying corals from you, which I can't cause I'm in Canada, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel like though, like there's something lacking though. Right. Like, I don't know what it is. I feel like, you know, I look at other people's tanks. I'm like, wow, your corals grow so fast. I mean, maybe we should start feeding our corals, like, yeah. you know, something, right. Whether it's amino or whether it's Benepets or reef chili or, you know, reef roids, like, Maybe maybe we're missing out on something, or maybe I should look at my, you know, potassium or or you know all those like molybdenum. Like I don't know. Maybe I should start like. Do, I mean, the thing is, like, I'm always worried though because I know that like importing, I feel like anything that you add to your tank can just like affect those corals so quickly. So I feel like that's kind of like why we run such like basic systems is it's it's all around you know importing and and trying to keep these things alive Mm -hmm. but i i almost feel like part of me wants to like start like a whole new system and you know put that system yeah right like once the coral lasts like eight months then you know start transferring those colonies into like this like reef moonshiner system because Mm -hmm. i feel like then it would grow and color up even more so it's it's you know, it's a fine balance between those two. And like right now we're just completely limited on space. Like we're literally every single, you know, like now our thing is like, all right, well we can double stack a tank here. But besides that, like we're completely out of space. So like, Mm -hmm. I I don't really have like the availability to like try that. You know, I think at some point down the line, like we definitely would like to get like a much bigger space, like maybe 4,000 or 5,000 square feet. But just you know with the economy and stuff right now like it, 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 i just don't i can't i just can't do it i mean i just like lean and mean right now is our model so mm-hmm. it's like unless like something completely changes like we're just stuck with the space that we have yeah but i mean it sounds like it sounds like for what you have you're definitely making the most of it it looks like you're putting a lot of orders orders out i think i saw a video of you guys packing and it was like just piles and piles of coolers ready to go <laughs> but you know what though here's the thing like it, it is right. I mean, we're probably doing like 120 boxes a month right now, wow. but like I, I have like this vision in my mind. I'm like, ah, oh, 120. Like I want to do a thousand a month, right? That's my <laughs> goal. If someone asks me, but the question is like, how many people are in this hobby? Like how many people are buying coral? Like someone told me that there's 700,000 people that have saltwater fish tanks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, if I could just get like 1% of that, you know? Yeah. So it's yeah. like this never ending grind in my mind of like, yeah, I don't know that, but well, and then it's also like how many people have saltwater tanks? How many people are like full on into like high end, expensive SPS frags too? You know, um, that's another. But thing, even right? lower end, like yeah. I'll be honest with you, like we're we've diversified now. Like we're yeah. selling lower end frags. I mean, we sell you know tenuous. You could get from us for twenty dollars. I mean, yeah. you could get you know corals for ten dollars. Like yeah, high end for sure, but you know, we've definitely expanded. So like, we definitely want to cater to, you know, people that are just starting off and, yeah. and people that are just getting into the hobby as well. Yeah. Yeah. I actually looked at your page before we started and I was impressed with like some of the big chunky frags and I thought the pricing was, was great on them. You know, some of these were like tenuous that were like a triple size frag for, you know, 200 bucks or something. So it, it wasn't bad at all. I mean, yeah, again, I'd buy from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. man. Yeah. Um, another question, um, do you run live rock in the systems or are they pretty bare as far as, um, that side of things? 
So I'm a huge proponent of live rock. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you look at our tanks, every single tank is jam packed with live rock, not only in the display, but also like in the sump. So like literally that's another, I guess, not secret, but that's like our filtration. Like, you know, so basically the way that we run our tanks is like, you know, like again, that standard 180 gallon tank will fill 60% of the top tank with like we'll literally jam pack it with live rock Mm -hmm. like from left to right back to center we stick as much rock as we can up to 60 percent of the tank Mm -hmm. and then on top on top of the live rock we level the live rock and then on top of the live rock we put black egg crate yeah so all of the corals basically sit on top of the black egg crate so that way we can you know, we could dip all the corals in one shot. We just take the whole rack out and, and dip it. Um, and then in our sump, we also literally pack the sump, which is much live rock as can mm-hmm. possibly fit in there. Mm-hmm. And then I, I do think, though, that so two of our SPS tanks systems, rather, one of them has sand and one of them doesn't have sand. Mm-hmm. And the one that has the sand, those definitely color up grow faster have much more pe than the one with no sand hmm. so i do think sand also is is a, is a is a really good thing yeah i guess it's just like a, a good really good surface area for some of probably the positive bacteria to uh to pro- proliferate in. um but uh yeah and it surprises me you use that much rock i mean i have a um my sump is filled with rock and um but i don't have any in the actual tanks um but <laughs> yeah that's uh that's that's quite a bit. I mean, you, you kind of think the more the merrier as far as rock surface area. Yeah, I mean, for us, like, you know, I, I just feel like it, it helps with the bacteria and it just it's just all around like a good thing to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, something I've wondered about, too, recently is I'm actually going to add some rock that's freshly well, freshly imported and it's sitting in a tub. Um, you know, whatever's dying off on it is is I'm gonna wait till that's clear, but I'm gonna add some of this Fiji rock to the system. Just I I think there's some just good mojo you get from that ocean rock that um, you know, maybe a little bit of a refresh here and there is probably not a bad idea. So do, do you mean you're going to take that and put it into your existing system? Yeah, or start yeah, a like because I have a ton of rock in there. But like I think that, you know, bacteria is a thing in our tanks that's always kind of shifting. Right. So, um, you know, the culture is going to be going, you know, this way or that way. Some of the bad mojo ones are going to kind of creep up from time to time. And I think if you're able to inject, um, you know, some of that that new fresh rock and you're going to get that good ocean bacteria back in the tank. Um, cause I just don't think like, do you dose any bacteria products in your system? No. no. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, it, even like a, after the chemi clean, like we just, you know, bomb it with chemi clean and, and we don't dose any bacteria after that. I mean, mm-hmm. everything just seems fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't know. Yeah. I've never been a huge, um, fan of any of the, the bacteria products on the market. Cause I just, I just don't really know what, what they're doing at the end of the day um but obviously if you're cycling a system we know things like microbacter and those products seem to seem to help for some people but um yeah i'm not convinced with any of them so far but um yeah it's hard to say i mean right now i think if i was to kind of critique my own system i think they're i think i'm lacking in some good strains of bacteria and i think when i look back on times when the tank just shined a little bit more um I think I think there was just a high, healthier microbiome going on, you know. Um, have you ever considered doing that aquabiomics test? I, I honestly don't even know what it is. Yeah. You know, I never really researched it. I know I've been hearing podcasts and people have been talking about it, but I haven't. Like again, like we just keep things like really, really simple. I think like you know, in terms of trying new things, like what would I try? Like I would love to try a new salt. Mm-hmm. That's why I keep like we're gonna like I said we're gonna change Ralph Salt probably to to the Red Sea regular just to see if like those Alks wings help anything you know not mm-hmm. having those Alks wings help but yeah we we haven't tried anything new for for a really long time yeah yeah okay interesting yeah I almost feel like maybe the Ghani system you want to just continue using the black if that's kind of maintaining the alkalinity but uh, but yeah yeah I mean I don't know like. I wish there was a little more scientific data on alkalinity swings and how they affect corals because we just like, you know, 
I definitely have lost corals before when I've had like a pretty big dip. I feel like one point. Like how big though? Yeah. See, I was going to say, I think one point is like whatever, not a big deal. Uh, maybe one point in 24 hours. It's probably going to be fine if you have healthy corals. Um, but something like 1.5 or 2 in a, in a 24 hour period, I would say you're probably, um, you know, you might lose something. Um, but yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, who knows? It's like, um, you know, why do we have elk swings? It's like a calcium reactor line got blocked or your dosing line got blocked. Um, you know, so, something happened. Um, is it that lack of bioavailability in that period um, that caused it? Or is it like the water chemistry itself that caused it, that shocked it? I'm not sure. Um, but I, I, I strongly think that, you know, the healthier the corals, the more resistant they're going to be to, to swings in the first place. I can tell you, though, two, two more, you know, thoughts uh, just on elk swings. I mean, two things that, that I would just would mention. So, you know, you mentioned, obviously, you're getting uh, some new shipments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So would we get uh, the, the, the incoming system where we take the shipments? We try to keep that elk once the, you know, new shipments coming in. Like I, I real I know this might sound insane, but I try to keep the elk at like six and a half or seven because when the new stuff comes in, we've tested the water and the elk is like six. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause it's in the bag. So like we try to keep that incoming system elk at like six, six and a half. So that way when the, the new like tenuous or whatever acros come in, it's coming into a lower elk system. Mm -hmm. I think that's also been something that has helped us in terms of like survival rate. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And then number two is that by accident, what happened was is like, like, so we have one system, which is like 600 gallons. And one day we basically did a water change with a hundred gallons of fresh water with, with non-salt water. Oh shit. How'd that happen? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how did that happen? Because one day we were like, you know, dipping or whatever, like dipping everything like thoroughly, like, you know, sometimes we just do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And we basically like just did a water change without realizing that it wasn't salt water. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, and this goes back to earlier when you said, well, you know, to use a tray in, so I, for some reason, I'm looking at my tray and, and the mag went from like 1400 to like 1290 within yeah. like an hour. I'm like, what the? Yeah. Eh? Right. I'm like, did you know, did you guys like do a water change without salt? And we were scratching our heads and it was like, oh, shit, we did. No and then way. I'm like, oh, shit. And so like the alk went from like eight to six and a half, you know, and it was like a panic moment. Right. I wonder we what the drop in salinity was. I could tell you what it was. Yeah. It went from like 1.026 to like 1. Point, wait, it was 1.026 to like 1.23. Okay, that's not crazy. That's not as crazy or, as I would have thought. Or maybe 1.22, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have to go back to check, but like we literally did not lose anything, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. So like the alk went from eight to six and a half. The mag went from fourteen hundred to twelve ninety. You know, the salt went from like 1.026 to 1.023 or 22, honestly. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose anything. Hmm. And I don't know if it's because like our, our system is really healthy. Like, I don't know if like someone else would lose anything. But, you know, that that was like a point and a half elk swing and everything was fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we immediately, you know, we immediately uh, added salt. I mean, we brought the salt right back up to like the, f the first day we brought it up to 1.024. Then the second day we brought up to 1025, then 1026. Yeah. And I think the key to that is if that happens and the alk does go from eight to six and a half, mm -hmm. just leave the alk at six and a half. Leave mm -hmm. it there. Like let it come back up to eight over like a week. Yeah. Right? Like don't don't go, oh shit, and then go from six and a half to eight because I think that up and down. Yeah, I that, agree. That, so so don't like panic, like just kind of let mm -hmm. everything settle and then let it slowly bring it back up. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I actually do kind of think that elk spikes, like elk alkalinity, like like rising too fast is more dangerous than it dropping, you know, because if it's dropping, usually it's dropping because of like consumption and the corals kind of brought it there in the first place, you know. So there's no point in panicking and trying to get it back to a number that you like in your head, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then it also like the last thing on elk is for us, like 
we like it when the ALK is on the down in a sense, right? Like, mm -hmm. so we don't really like when our ALK is rising. I mean, it, it does naturally, like something goes wrong and the coral stop consuming a little bit and the ALK goes from like, you know, seven to seven and a half to eight to eight and a half. Mm -hmm. Like we like it when the ALK is on the downswing. I agree. Because we feel like, you know, the corals are like fighting for that and it's on the down. So like when we do our water changes, the out goes from like seven to eight, right? Because of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But then after like a week, it's back down to seven again, mm -hmm. right? Just from the week's consumption. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, we, we just, we found that the corals act better when the alk is like on the downswing. Yeah. And actually that kind of uh, brings something up for me is um, when I was away on this trip, I was, um, uh, I kind of set this, I got like this mini split that kind of, I heat and cool my garage with it. Um, and I've been kind of trying to dial it in to kind of heat the garage at night properly. Anyways, um, the first few, few days of the trip, I didn't notice a big difference. But then um, I was noticing my tank was a lot cooler at night and then it wasn't quite getting up to the normal temperature. So it was kind of 76 to 77 was kind of the range. And my elk started going up and started climbing. And I think that kind of proved to me that temperature actually correlates with growth. Um, more than more than I thought. I, I don't know if there's anything because I wasn't even home. I wasn't changing anything else, right? Um, and uh, now that I've got the temperature back up, the elk consumption's starting to uh, creep up again. So interesting thought. So what I do mean, you What do you keep your temperature at? Like, what's your ideal well, temp? Usually, it's like seventy. I mean, if I could be really specific, I'm kind of shooting for seventy seven point five to eight, or or seventy seventy eight. Um, yeah, like around 78 is kind of my go-to, but you know, I'd have days where I'd hit 79. Um, and I, you know, I don't worry until something's like well above 80, like 82 or 83. Not that I've gotten there in a long time as metal halide days when I used to hit those temperatures. But, um, yeah, I think, uh, it'd be an interesting study to, and I mean, if anybody wants to try this and reach out to me, you know, try your tank up a degree and a half or something for like, two weeks and tell me if the alkalinity consumption um, went up because it, it's kind of like um, think about like a greenhouses like and how they you know they ultra heat the plants and the plants grow fast as hell in those greenhouses right it's uh you know I mean this is plants versus animals but um, I feel like it, there's probably something to that like what's your kind of range you shoot for for temperature so uh, yeah so like for me I like the temperature between 73 and like 76. Okay. So we, I, I like to keep them on the, on the cooler side. Um, I just feel like when it is on the cooler side, things happen or can happen a lot slower. Yeah. So like for me, like I don't, I'm not, I'll be honest with you. Like I'm not trying to grow my coral super fast or, you know, whatever, because I, I just want to keep them alive, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, at hotter temperatures, things happen a lot faster. So I feel like I just like cooler temperatures, like between 73, 75, 76. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's why when I had an elk swing a point and a half down, like it, nothing died. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I also know that like when I ship corals, I try to ship them. Like I love it when they ship at like 72 degrees, 68 degrees. I much rather them ship colder than hot. Mm -hmm. Like I've gone to coral shows before you know, not knowing what the heck I was doing. And like, I would literally leave the, like if something didn't sell at the end of the show or even on the way to the show, I would put the corals in my, I just put them in my suitcase. I have like a system where I put mm -hmm. them in like a cooler and then they go into like a suitcase and we check it onto the plane. If I don't put a heat, if I don't put a cold pack on that, like if I go to the show, I'll have like 20% depth. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but Crazy. the second I put like, four or five cold packs in there everything mm. comes to the show perfect i wonder so too because I just, your corals are obviously adapted to a little lower temperature range like that's a fair bit lower than most people run like that's 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 something you do differently yeah yeah but again i i just like i want and i i know people that keep their tank at 79 and they're like my growth is insane i'm like it probably is because mm -hmm. at those temperatures i think everything happens a lot faster yeah and you know one thing in terms of like what we're doing, you know, if you import or whatever, like you're going to get, you know, whatever it is, like bugs, you know, whatever kind of things you're going to get, like flatworms or whatever. Mm -hmm. I feel like even those pests can grow a lot faster at high temperatures. Yeah. So faster metabolism, just, right? Yeah. 
I I think so. I yeah. mean, so for us, like we're we're trying to keep it like seventy three to seventy six. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's something to think about for sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, the one thing about talking to guests on this podcast is just, you know, some of my guests like back to the live rock thing. Some of my guests barely use any live rock, and they they think they have enough, you know, nitrif- nitrifying bacteria on the surfaces of the glass and the racks and whatever else is in there. Um, plus the corals obviously, but, um, yeah, I mean, it just, if anything, it's like getting this data from people at times kind of makes me go, well, shit, I thought I was starting to figure some stuff out. And then this guy does it completely differently. <laughs> but... I mean, I'll be honest with you, like your corals look phenomenal, right? So like, I okay. feel like you shouldn't change a thing. You shouldn't be worried about, oh, da, da, da. like, just, just do exactly what you're doing. Like, mm-hmm. there's no reason to all of a sudden bring your temp to 74 or you know stop using kz or you know whatever it is like if it works like just don't break you know it's all good yeah and the other thing too i mean like i think just we our tanks hit a stride sometimes you know sometimes the system is just you know you didn't really change anything but it just looks awesome that week or for a couple months or whatever and then sometimes it's always going to get a little worse for a while too it's that up and down like emotional coral roller coaster of you know what we're doing right so why do you think that is like some people think that it's a seasonal thing because you mentioned i mean your water coming out of your tap is 20 tds right like Mm -hmm. i was talking to for example uh joe from tusi reef Mm -hmm. last week and he made a very interesting comment he said in the summer he doesn't do any water changes because the water is so bad yeah from his well that like it's just like gonna kill his tank but in the winter he said he can do water changes yeah so maybe it's like a a seasonal thing with like how clean your water is coming out of the tap which then yeah leads me to uh, like changing your membrane every two month thing you know (laughs) yeah well no that's true because the reservoirs are lower in the summer um and they're probably just like there's probably more gunk and concentration of some of those impurities. Um, yeah, I noticed it because this summer we didn't get a lot of rain, and um, I noticed those that uh, my pre filters got brown within like I don't know like a, two weeks is pretty brown. So I've been changing the pre filter once a month instead of you know once every couple months or whatever. But um, yeah, that's a thing to consider. I wonder if like you know maybe. I don't know. I haven't found my corals or my systems to do worse from season to season, but I think that influx in, um, you know, overall like health and hitting those strides is, I think there's a few things at play. Like, I think it's like, I think bacteria is part of it. I think that like the biome of the system is always, always changing and, you know, bacteria is converting some of the things we feed into things that are bioavailable to the corals. Um, so that's like, I think that's just that shift that's always happening. Um, the other thing I would say is is trace elements are going to be changing and the composition of how they interact with each other um, is probably a big part of it too. But um, man, there's just always something changing, right? So like, how do you, how do you, like people say to me sometimes like, oh, like I've been doing the same thing with my tank for this much time. I don't know why this coral is dying. It's like, it's because you've been doing the same thing and, and like eventually something's going to shift. So with these um, like speciosas, are these the first round of speciosa that you're getting? Have you had experience with them in the past? Like, have um, you gotten a few? As, you know. Yeah, I got a few frags maybe three years ago, and um, when I had that sort of semi crash, they were like the first ones to go. Um, but one of them was growing really well. Um, unfortunately, it was like the least colorful of the three of them that I had. Um, but uh, other than that, no, we haven't seen a lot of them in Canada yet. Um, any advice for light for them, like right off the bat? Um, I think that like, you know, radion wise, like I think like 250 or 300 par, I, I feel like to get them in and blast them, I don't think they really like that. Yeah. I think like a 250 ish par, I think is a good, is a good starting okay. point. And then, you know, once the polyps start to come out, you know, you can kind of ramp that up. I mean, it, it's kind of hard playing the par game, I, I think. So mm-hmm. like, you know, like in our systems, I'll be like, whatever, we just throw them in 400 par, you know, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think like it's, it's worse than, than low par, but if I could, I would just say like, maybe bring them in a little lower than mm-hmm. like, you know, a blast, yeah. you know, maybe 250 or 300 or so. Yeah. I'm actually yeah I am gonna... would love to, I would love to follow up with you like later on, you know, yeah. after your shipment to see like how it all dices out. Yeah. And I'm actually going to start them in my LPS system. Um, 
because for one thing, it's I kind of use it as a quarantine system because there's no acros in there. Like, can't really infect other acros with flatworms if you don't have any. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to start them in there. And um, one thing that I was talking to Farmer Ty about, and he made this point that um, maybe some of these corals from different regions do better in their own system. Like if you keep, you know, all Aussie corals together, all Indo, because there might be some bacterial things that don't get along. Um, have you mixed your Malaysian and, and Indo together generally? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we haven't kept anything separate that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a bad theory though. You know, yeah. uh, I wish we had more tanks so that way we could, yeah. you know, start doing that. But yeah, I, we haven't tried anything like that yet. Yeah. And at the same time you were saying you do that chemical um, dose when you have the imported pieces come in. So you're probably zapping some of those like funky strains of bacteria potentially right off the bat. Right. I mean, that's been a complete game changer, yeah. you know, in terms of like importing Indo stuff. Like we used to, like, I'm telling you, like we used to even lose like 50 to 70% over like a month or two. It was like, mm -hmm. what the hell? Yeah. And like, I don't even know why. And, and even like with the main system, like I know some people say like all of a sudden, like their coral start RTNing and then it, like it takes over their whole tank. I mean, it, it just sounds like a nightmare story. Mm -hmm. So when we have anything that's like looking funky in the main system, like a little RTN for no reason. And we're like, what the hell? Like, which is dose chemically into the whole tank. I mean, for mm -hmm. us, it, you know, it's almost like a yeah. regimen that we do like every three to four months. And you know, it seemed fine for us. I mean, I don't know if that's like part of our success or not, but definitely it's it's super safe for the tank and we, we do it anytime we see anything looks a little funky. Yeah. And then what happens is like, you'll even see it. Like sometimes like, you know, you, you mentioned to your tank, you know, like sometimes like when you're not in that stride season, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like the polyps aren't out as much and something's like a little off. Like we dose chemi clean and then like I said, like 48 hours later, we do a water change mm -hmm. and then we'll do a water change the following week. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like the corals are exploding with polyps. The alk is dropping. So like mm -hmm. it, it works. I don't know how or why, but it, it does work. Yeah, I've experienced the same thing. I probably do it twice a year. Um, even like I don't have cyano in the tank. I just find if things are just not looking great. And it's been kind of like that for a little while. Maybe I've lost a couple pieces or had some STN or something. Um, I do find that the chemical clean does some good things. And my understanding of it is that it does tend to target more of the bacteria that's in the water versus the good bacteria that's on your surfaces. Um, but I mean, I could fact check that. I don't know for sure. Um, but <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't know how much time you have left, but I usually do these uh, rapid fire questions. So depending yeah, on how, I mean, listen, I could yeah. go, I could go for another 15 or 30 minutes. I mean, Sweet. whatever, you know, we have a great conversation. Like I said, I really yeah. appreciate being here. So I, I'll give it my, give it my all. Okay. Yeah. Cause sometimes the rapid fire questions are not very rapid. Like we start going off on a rant about something. So, um, yeah, let's just, let's just see. So, uh, first rapid fire question, uh, what's your favorite fish? The first thing that comes to my mind is a black tang. Yeah. But is it my favorite fish? I, I don't necessarily think so. I think like my favorite type of fish are, are like wrasses and gobies yeah. and like, you know, like yasha gobies and all those little like my, I think like my favorite type of fish really are like the little nano fish. Yeah. Some of those wrasses just blow me away. Some of those flashers and and mystery wrasses, a fish I've never had that I always I always wanted. I got to get one one of these days. Apparently they're assholes. I hear. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I don't have one of those. So I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, favorite SPS? You can say a species. You can say a, like a name piece. I mean, it's it's definitely going to be tenuous. Mm -hmm. I think my all time favorite tenuous, hands down, is the Matt V Looney Tune. Mm, I don't think I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Sweet. like one of the OG pieces. My second favorite piece that comes to mind is just the the Walt Disney. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, Mike Bigger, who was the creator of that. I mean, he was like, I think the person who really started like the name game. And I just have so much respect for him. I mean, he yeah. passed away, rest yeah. his soul. But he was I, I definitely miss him. I mean, he was like the first person who started like all those Facebook groups. And, you know, they're very successful. So I, I, we definitely lost someone big when he yeah. 
you know yeah i I didn't know him personally but he definitely i mean the walt disney just lives on his legacy through that coral because like you probably know from importing um from farms in indo um we haven't really seen anything from the farms that's exactly the same i got something from bali aquarium that i would say is like 90 percent the same um but yeah it's just it's one of those corals that got was probably a wild piece that he got his hands on at one point was just like, wow, what the heck, what is this? And then it grows so well that just look how much it's spread like all over North America. And uh, I even somebody's just telling me they have it in Europe now. Like somebody actually presented the uh, the CITES to show that he'd imported it. So um, really? Yeah, it's kind of cool, though. It's cool to see. That's crazy. See these coral babies live on. <laughs> yeah. Another one that I, I really love, too, is the Rainbow Splice. Um, I just basically bought like three frags in the last two weeks. I'm on like a rainbow splice kick. I just traded um, somebody, one of uh, Anon, who's um, he's a really yeah. good grower. He's, he's going to be on the podcast soon. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. No, I would love. I'm going to definitely tune in for that one. Sweet. He's he's a spectacular grower, and he. Um, I just got like two frags off of him in trade, and then Michael Saucedo from Speed Reefer. I just grabbed a frag from him. Sweet. I, I think like. I think that that rainbow place is really worth the money because, you know, if you can grow SPS, it's it's a somewhat fast grower. Yeah. And, is. you know, it, it, you can really like make a lot of money uh, from that coral <laughs> yeah. growing it. So it's it's really one of my favorites for yeah. that reason. And just the contrast of the red and that yellowy color. It's just the, yeah, it's definitely one of the best pieces I own, too, for sure. It's awesome. Um, yeah. I could talk about SPS all day, honestly. Um, <laughs> uh, what would you say is your favorite LPS? So I'm like huge on like mushrooms. Mushrooms are LPS, right? No, they're softies. That's the next question. Oh, they're softies. That's just... <laughs> See, this is, I'll tell you guys, I'm not, I'm really not an expert. Uh, so favorite LPS, what, well, like a torch? Yeah. Torches. torches yeah yeah no i love tor- i'll be i mean i'll be honest with you I'm, I'm i get like these crazy kicks right like i have a crazy ghani collection crazy mushroom mm. collection crazy torch collection like when i get the bug for whatever that that is like i will literally seek out every single one of that type of coral yeah. whether it's an lps softy you know yeah. acro it doesn't matter like whatever the next thing is like i'll, I'll just go so hard Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden we had like this Ghani kick and now we have like a 180 that's just like literally packed rim to rim with Ghanis. Yeah, that's um, sweet. But yeah, I mean like in terms of like torches and stuff, like I would say my favorite right now are probably like those tiger torches. Yeah, they can be pretty awesome. They can be quite variable too, hey? Like I find the – the because, the, you know, some torches are kind of like they just look the way they look. But the tiger torches have like different kind of like tiger marks in them kind of thing. So – yeah, don't, let me tell you though those are also somewhat a survival of the fittest like yeah. if we import like a hundred of those like 30 of them will die within like two weeks it's like yeah. so annoying yeah. but those are definitely a very finicky one too yeah that's good to know yeah i have one one head of one that i'm i'm growing it's uh i think i've had it for six months it's a few heads now but yeah it's 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 doing okay but uh um okay so we're gonna say for softy you're probably a mushroom mushroom guy yeah, I mean, I yeah. originally, you know, we started with with Zos. That was our thing. Like everyone was like, "Oh, SBB Zos." Like we know SBB for their Zos. Like yeah. you know, the Marvin, the Martian, the Hephaestus, which everyone butchers their name. Um, there's so many others. Like the Little Shop of Horror was something That's a actually one. the yeah, the wicked one. Uh, the GMK. We were a part of that. You know, when it originally came in. Um, so we were like the Zoe guy. And then for whatever reason, like all of our Zoes pretty much died. Hmm. I think it was probably the TMP. So we lost our whole entire Zoe collection. And then, you know, we started with the Acros. And then now everyone knows us for the Acros. They're like, yeah. Shane the Acro guy. They're like, and then someone's like, no, Shane the Zoe guy. And they're like, what? No. <laughs> um, yeah, now now we're on a, a big mushroom kick. Like we just found like an awesome supplier of mushrooms. So like we got like these like, yumas that we're getting in that are like four or five inches like they're just like the size of your hand yeah so like we're on a kick of that right now the size of your hand a yuma that big crazy like like not like the palm of your hand not the full yeah oh yeah yeah. like if you look at our our instagram yeah you'll see that like they're literally like four or five inches like they're super meaty like they're just awesome cool yeah awesome uh i probably know the answer to this question but what is your favorite light 
source or product? There, there'd be Radeon LEDs. And I, I have yeah. to tell you, like, we literally have not tried any other light. Yeah. Those are the ones we had from, like, day one. So we just, like, never changed them out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And widely used. And in, in like we were talking about, um, a lot of your customers are going to have the same lights. So it's nice to have that standardization, I think, for sure. Um, okay. Uh, what would you say is your kind of favorite product line? If you were kind of using, say, one product line for like your your salt, your major elements, like what? who do you kind of like that's in the game right now? I mean, right away, I would just say ESV. Uh, yeah. That's another one that we basically just use from day one and we've never changed it. So I, I don't know if there's anything else better, but they've been like rock solid and it, it just seems to have been working really good for us. And, you know, I would say ESV. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next question is salt, um, which I guess, you know, you've been using Red Sea. Um, yeah. I mean, we probably can skip over that because we kind of went over that. But uh, well, well yeah. I, I don't know if we should, because yeah. I mean, like this is a constant thing that I want to talk about with people mm-hmm. Is, mm-hmm. is the salt. You know, I know a lot of people that are growing with like reef crystals, like they just like love reef crystals. Mm-hmm. They think it's like the best thing that they've ever used. I know like one person who was like the expert when it comes to this Malaysia topic um, was BK Chem, right? Mm, it was someone yeah. that, yeah. So and he, is he out of the game now or because I haven't seen him post in, in a long time? I honestly don't know. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen him post. I haven't talked to him. I mean, I, I have no idea where he is, but mm-hmm. I can tell you, though, that he was definitely a master at his craft. It like, looked I've like been it. to his house. Yeah. Yeah, like, it was like, wow. Like, this is serious, right? Yeah. And he, I think, used reef crystals right or was it reef crystals what's the other version of reef crystals well, instant ocean instant ocean right yeah. it was one of those two and yeah. he, he used that and i'm like well is that the secret to speciosa because not only did he keep speciosa alive but he knew how to grow speciosa yeah. as well it looked like it um yeah, yeah so i i don't know right so when it comes to the salt topic it's like what's the best salt why is it the best salt like i, I have no idea so that's why i kind of like you know, when I mentioned Ralph and changing his salt, I feel like we're just, I'm going to just keep trying to like mm-hmm. try, try until like we see something that is better than another thing. Like what am I like? I would love to like get like, you know, like four, like 300 gallon systems and just like run them exactly the same, but like use four different salts, you know, yeah, yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah. And there's some posts on like reef to reef and whatnot where people have uh, ICP'd all the different brands. So you can kind of see what the trace element composition kind of lands at but i bet it changes like you know some of these like trace elements are in the parts per billion so like how do you make every single batch like exactly the same it just seems like it seems impossible to me but i don't know much about the manufacturing side so um yeah it's uh (laughs) i don't know man but yeah um yeah, the salt thing. There's always this like a fantasy to salt too is that you're going to change salt and all of a sudden your tank's going to be better, you know. I mean, I hoped for it when I changed to fauna or to tropic, but things look about the same. Pretty good. Can't complain. <laughs> um, so so yeah, th- that'll be an ongoing one. But yeah, salt to me is just a mystery that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you have a favorite aquarium controller? Um... I mean, I use a Triton, but I mean, is that really a controller? I don't know. I mean, that just tests the elements. I don't, I don't yeah. use that to dose. Like for anyone who's going to use the Triton and actually like mechanically dose your stuff, like if your Triton reads eight and you're trying to get eight yeah. to five, like it'll automatically like that's just crazy to me. Like, yeah, because if the Triton's off, like you're going to be screwed. But yeah, I mean, I think like I, I use that again just as like something I can look at, you know, to see if something like Quick when reference, I had that. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, like when we did a hundred, you know, water change with regular water, like I was like, oh shit, the mag just dropped to nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. Like you wouldn't have noticed the only reason it. Why we used... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're using Apex then. Ape. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your favorite wave pump, or most used in your setup? So the only pumps that we use are the MP40s from Ecotech. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. MP40s are solid. Totally. Uh, most hated pest you've dealt with? I mean, to me, I don't really like think pests are that complicated, honestly. Like I, I like have embraced them. Some would disagree. I've literally, <laughs> I, I've just embraced, I mean, listen, like yeah. I said, if you're importing coral, you're going to get pests. I don't care what anyone says. They're coming in 
they're coming in nonstop. Like mm-hmm. they're going to come in on every single shipment that you're going to get, right? Like whether you get flatworms or whether you get white bugs or red bugs. I haven't seen white or red bugs through import, honestly. I don't know mm-hmm. where those originate from, but it, you know, those are very easy to kill. Red bugs, interceptor, yeah, interceptor white bugs. Yeah. Yeah, white bugs four times the dose, you know, whether mm-hmm. you get like acro eating flatworms, like those die in seconds with potassium, not seconds, but they die within four minutes with like potassium chloride. So like, yeah. to me, like, I don't really care. Like, I just think you have to have a rock solid quarantine system. And for us, it's easy because like, you know, we don't have like a grow out tank per se where like we put corals on rocks, like they're all on egg crates. Mm-hmm. So we can easily dip every single thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, we had like when we first started, we had a tank and it was beautiful, right? It was on rocks, it was encrusting, and then we had we got flatworms. Yeah, so we had to cut everything off the rocks and put it onto racks. And ever since then, we just you know kept it on racks. But like I said, like if we had more space, I would start like you know a 600 gallon system and I would like do the reef moonshiners method and mm-hmm. you know like really go hard. But yeah, so pests pest don't scare me right now. Yeah. You know, they, they're That's just cool. part, of the, part of the hobby. Um, on the but, subject But what of... I can tell you, though... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. One, sorry. One thing about the pests is, like, I strongly recommend that anyone who gets coral, like, from vendor, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter if they've, like, been in business for 25 years, like, you should definitely dip every single coral that comes into your system. I would tell you to get a jeweler's lens... So you can look at everything under like some magnification because you could have like an egg in like a little crack of a rock that like no mm-hmm. one can see. Totally. Like I would go even further and say like if you're heavily into SPS, right? Like if you're someone who's spending like five hundred dollars a month on SPS or a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars a month on SPS, like you should have a quarantine system, right? Yeah. I don't I mean I know like yeah space is limiting, but like if you have like a three hundred gallon system and you're you know like you could have a quarantine. Like just get like a thirty gallon bio cube and whenever you do water changes off your main system, you literally change out eighty percent of the yeah. bio cube water and you never have to keep parameters. Like that totally. that should be like a like a like a 101 procedure for mm-hmm. anyone getting into SPS, like have a quarantine system. Yeah. And then you've got a batch of like um, tank water that's kind of the same as your tank and it's sitting there. It's like an emergency tank too, right? Like it's totally good point for sure. Um, back onto the potassium chloride. What is the um, ratio? Are you like one tablespoon a gallon? What do you, can, can you tell me your protocol? Yeah, so potassium chloride, from what I've been told, it's like a really high concentration of salt. Like if your, you know, tank is at 1026, this is at like 1.4 or something yeah. like ridiculously high, right? Hypersalinity. So like yeah. hypersalinity, yeah. So our our um dose is two tablespoons for ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Per gallon. That's per gallon. Yeah, yeah per gallon. Now okay. you could put the coral in there for 25 minutes you could do four tablespoons for 25 minutes and the coral would be absolutely fine really we've actually absolutely fine like you could try this like go get a browned out coral put it in four tablespoons for Mm -hmm. 10 minutes for you know 30 minutes whatever 25 minutes it'll be fine now one thing that we've noticed is that and this is just like a tangent but just to help try to help people out like if we're cutting frags, if we cut like 400 frags in one day, which sounds like a lot, right? But when there's three people cutting frags, like mm-hmm. you could get there. Like, you know, naturally, like, you know, like we'll come in and over a week or two, like 30 or 40 frags will die, right? We're like, what the hell? So what we started doing now is as we're dipping these colonies, I mean, as we're cutting these colonies, because they're all on these frag racks, right? Mm-hmm. We'll take the whole entire colony We'll put it in potassium chloride for like a minute and then we'll just shake the colony like this Mm -hmm. and then we frag it. We found that the success rate of the frags living are much higher Mm. if we literally are dipping the colony as we're fragging it. Interesting. I wonder if also um, like you probably use like a Griffin saw for some of your LPS. Um, I wonder if there'd be benefit to putting potassium chloride in the... um, the water in the saw you know for the same reason yeah yeah but yeah i've recovered some lps before um after dipping them in potassium chloride and and like gluing over like a, a spot of recession so it's definitely i think it has some anti microbial microbial properties um 
but uh, I can't get into details on that. Not not well versed enough, but uh, yeah, man, interesting. Um, yeah, I've I've definitely um, gotten on the potassium chloride train recently, um, and uh, it's interesting that you say you can dose it at a much higher higher dose. I do two tablespoons per gallon as well, um, and for five minutes. But uh, ten minutes, you say, is fine. Dude, five minutes is like 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 nothing, nothing like to them. 10 minutes it's like nothing like mm-hmm. 10 minutes is like nothing okay. like uh, every single like people like i mean like people joke around like oh we get your frags like nothing comes off of them like no pods none of those um those little worms you know nothing comes off of the sps like we literally are dipping the potassium chloride like like as the frags are going into the bags to be shipped yeah they're being dipped in potassium chloride right before we ship them yeah like, okay. like, so, so we're, yeah. And like, we th- find the success rate of shipping is much higher if we dip them right before we send them out. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's, that's something I consider for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So the last question, it's uh, kind of more of a thought experiment. Um, if you had the financial means and the sort of life situation to do so, would you set up something like Polo Reef? So can you elaborate on that in terms so, of like when you say like like what aspects of Polo Reef? So, okay. So if you had the financial means to set up a tank that is like that, you know, that I don't know what it costs, $20 million, something like that, um, would would you do that? So when you mean like that, do you mean, I think, I, I don't know exactly how many gallons. I think it's 20,000 gallons. Yeah, so 14,000. So do you mean set that type of tank up yeah. or do you mean set up all the other tanks like that? No, I mean the main display because it's, I think it's for a lot of hobbyists. That's kind of like a fantasy type of situation is to have something like that. But, uh, would, would you do it? Got it. So, so the answer to my question is like, so I'm going to take 50% of his, 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 the answer is no, I wouldn't do the 14,000 gallon, but mm. I would do everything else. Everything else that he has, I would do it. Yeah, he's got so many other tanks. He's got a lab. He's got quarantines. He's got, you know, I just wouldn't do the fourteen thousand gallon only because I love to handle my corals with my hand, right? Yeah. Whether that's dipping them or whether that's cutting them or whether that's just inspecting them or moving them around or rearranging them, mm-hmm. like you know, I'm constantly rearranging my stuff and moving it around, and I just feel like. For me, with that size of a tank, I, I just couldn't handle the coral the way I wanted. I would yeah. want to handle it, yeah. but I would literally do everything else except for a tank that size. Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. That's that's a little different, and I, I think where 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 that comes from, what you're talking about with having your hands in the tank, there's something like therapeutic about it. Like you probably feel the same way, right? Do you, like sometimes you probably just go into your room and you kind of just like mess around and tinker for an hour and you're just like i don't even know what i did but i just kind of had a good time just zoning out and messing around with my corals you know it's it's uh i don't know it's it's nice to hear that too for a, like a vendor like because you know we're we're hobbyists but we're we're selling coral too <laughs> yeah. no and i mean yeah. like one of the things i love doing too is like taking you know taking pictures and like i take pictures a very certain way where i have to move the coral around I basically, um, you know, and again, this could be a secret, right? But what we do is with the pictures is we basically take the a frag rack and we put the frag rack like one inch under the water line. Mm-hmm. So that way the coral is like all the way at the front of the tank, like away from the lights a little bit. So that way you don't have any glare. Yeah. And then the coral's all the way at the water line. So we're taking a picture like literally directly over the coral yeah. where it's like a millimeter under the water cool. and i just think like if i had a fourteen thousand gallon tank i wouldn't be able to, to to manipulate the coral and take the pictures like that yeah 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 it's nice getting up close some of those corals too it's like the the viewing them up close is where it's at um like a tank like polar reef would be more suited to you know the oregon torts and those co- more solid colored acroporas and montes and stuff like that but uh yeah cool man well i think this is probably a good place to close off um yeah, we should uh, do this again, and maybe we'll hit like a hard subject or something, or I don't know. We can we can see, but uh, yeah, man, thanks thanks for your time. Yeah, no, I definitely want to you know definitely follow up with you. Um, we basically have like a podcast, but it's it's like an Instagram live, so yeah. I would love to have you on. Sure, yeah, um, totally. as a guest. 
you know, for our uh, our followers, would love to hear from you, and yeah. I would love to follow back up with you once you get that shipment in, so like, we can kind of compare notes on how we can keep those things alive. You know, yeah, speciosis totally. Better. But yeah, that'd be fun. Let's let's turn the tables, and you can ask me all all the stuff <laughs> I asked you in the reverse order. <laughs> okay, cool, man. Definitely sweet. Thanks so much. Cool, man. Well, um, yeah, let's definitely keep in touch. Cool. Sounds good, man. Cool. Cheers. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Beyond the Reef with Shane Backer of SBB Corals. Make sure you check out his website at sbbcorals.com and also definitely check out his Instagram because he posts a lot of good content on there as well, which is pretty easy to find if you look up SBB Corals. He also hosts a regular Instagram live stream where he talks to other reef hobbyists as well. And if you have any suggestions for future guests, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.